I'm going to give you an example of how old I am. I'm not a Dallas Cowboys fan, but I remember when Tom Landry was the head coach for the Cowboys. He was the coach of the Dallas Cowboys from 1960 to 1988. And I wasn't alive when he started, but back in the early days that he was coach of the Cowboys, they were terrible. So they've really been able to maintain a great legacy. But back in those days, expansion teams did not have the rules that they have today. He didn't get a bunch of, of draft choices. There was no free agency back then. And it would really take a long time to build a team. And so the first two or three years that the Cowboys played while Tom Landry was the head coach, they were one miserable team. They were regularly trounced by their opponents. Some of Landry's critics said to him, you know, part of your problem is you're such a, a stoic personality. You don't know how to fire these guys up. You don't have the passion on the sidelines like, say, a Vince Lombardi. Well, one particular game, the sports writers were amazed to see the Cowboys just roar from the locker room out onto the field, across the field, over to the sidelines. And a, a sports writer caught up with Landry on the field. He said, Coach, what did you say to get your players so charged up? And Landry replied, it was easy. I said, the last 11 guys to the bench have to start. <laughs> so Coach Landry, being the believer that he was, practiced the last shall be first principle in the early days of his career. And our culture does not typically endorse a last will be first mentality. But Jesus affirms that there are real and eternal blessings to be gained by entering the countercultural kingdom of God. This is a kingdom that welcomes the meek and mourners, and most of all, resolute destitutes. Because the first thing that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount about the kingdom of God is this. And remember, he's talking to a bunch of, of firebrands who think that the Messiah is going to help them overthrow Rome. They were ready to go get their swords and start this military campaign. And the very first thing that Jesus says is, blessed are the Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is not the kind of language that our culture speaks fluently. You will not find many people talking about how they are down and out and messed up and poor in spirit, not in earnest unless you find a rare group of people who are willing to own up to their failure and their inadequacies, and you know where you're most likely to find a group of people like that? In 12-step programs. Because the first step is that you have to admit you have absolute powerlessness to manage your own life. Now, Jesus didn't give 12 steps, he gave eight. But the first step to experiencing a vital kingdom life, the first and most important truth to face in kingdom life is this. Write it down. I am a recovering self-aholic. Isn't it interesting that Jesus begins not with what we think about God, but with what we think about ourselves? Because what usually hinders our experiencing the reign of God is our view of ourselves. Perhaps you heard about the wife that was trying to elicit a compliment or two from her husband. And she said, honey, do you love me because I am astonishingly beautiful, extremely sharp and intelligent, 
or stunningly sensual. He said, well, darling, most of all, I'm grateful for your vivid imagination. You see, we will pay almost any price to exalt self. We are self-aholics. If you're a sports fan like I am, you will recall the controversy years back in Major League Baseball regarding steroid abuse. Players were found out to have been padding their statistics by illegally using enhancement-performing drugs. That sentence. Why would anybody risk long-term physical detriment for something that offers short-term exaltion of self? In 1995, there was this poll that was taken of sprinters, swimmers, and powerlifters, and other athletes. Most of them were all U.S. Olympians in this poll, and they were asked this simple question. If you were offered a banned performance-enhancing substance with two guarantees that you would not be caught and that you would win, would you take it? 195 out of 198 participants in this poll said, yeah, I would. Now, if you think that's bad, they were also asked another question. They were asked this, if you were offered a banned performance-enhancing substance with two guarantees that you wouldn't be caught and you will win every competition that you will enter for the next five years, and then you will die from the side effects of that substance, would you still take it? More than 60% of the respondents said, yeah, I think I would. We are into self-confidence, self-sufficiency, self-improvement, self-righteousness. And then Jesus preaches this Sermon on the Mount. A sermon that boldly challenges our self-delusions. A sermon that exposes our self-aholism. Chapter 5, you are impressed with yourself because you don't commit adultery, but the real you is full of lust. Chapter 6, you are impressed with yourself because you hold up your hands on the street corners and you pray out loud. But the real you didn't do it to impress God, but men. Chapter 7, you're impressed with yourself because you can spot specks in people's eyes. But you cannot see the redwood forest in your own. You see, if you're going to enter the kingdom of God, the first thing Jesus says is you you got to lay pretense at the altar. We are all self-aholics. But only the poor in spirit will actually admit that. The poor in spirit confess their spiritual bankruptcy, their poverty of true righteousness. To be poor in spirit is to acknowledge, I struggle with self-aholism. And you admit that you can never earn citizenship in the kingdom of God. The Greeks had about nine different words for being poor. And at least two of those words are found in our New Testament. The word that Jesus used for poor is abject destitution. It's only used of two different individuals in our New Testament. It's used of the widow in Mark chapter 12 that only had two coins. And when she gave those two coins to the Lord, she had nothing left. Understand what he's saying about being poor in spirit. The other time this word is used is in Luke when he's describing Lazarus. The Lazarus, by the way, that was in Luke 16, who was the beggar outside of the gates of the rich man, not the one that's the friend of Jesus that he got to call out of the tomb. Look at how it's described in Luke 16. It says, at his gate was laid a beggar, that's the word actually, named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. He was so poor, all he could do was hope while the dogs were licking his sores that somebody might throw him a little bit of food. And here's the point. The only way that you can receive the kingdom of God is by begging. That's how destitute 
you actually are before God. You've got to get over your self aholism and see yourself as God actually sees you. And this is not an easy word for us self aholics to hear. There's something inside of us that remains convinced. You know, God is surely impressed with, with what I'm doing. I mean, he's got to be impressed with how I'm becoming so much better than I used to be. But look with me at Luke chapter 18 for a moment. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. Follow along in your own Bible. Jesus says, it says this, To, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast. And he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The question this morning is this. Do we believe this word strong enough to be a resolute destitute? Am I going to choose, am I going to pursue, am I going to be intentional about addressing my self aholism and being poor in spirit? You're going to have to muster up faith. You are going to have to find the faith first to believe this, write it down, that the first will be last. You see, Jesus sees two kinds of people. Those that exalt themselves and those that humble themselves. Now the irony is that those who exalt themselves do so by clinging to the spiritual equivalent of fool's gold. Now you know what fool's gold is. It's an ore that gives the impression of having great value when in reality it's worthless. Did that Pharisee really think that his righteousness was so impressive to God that it could pay off his debts to God? Some years ago, a, ga a, a band of gangsters in France got away with the equivalency of 1.5 million U.S. dollars in French currency. But the thieves had a problem. They stole all that money in coins. And it was worth, each coin, only about $2 each, but the totality weighed about 17 tons. So a Paris newspaper taunted the bandits with this statement. You cannot buy a chateau, a car, or a pair of crocodile shoes with bags of change. And if you go to celebrate... The owner of even the smallest cafe will become suspicious before you even drop the tenth coin on the counter. The article continued, their punishment is included in their success. They will have to spend their loot franc by franc. They will have to buy millions of bottles of soda drinks. But what else? You might call that a wealth of poverty. It is very, very hard for rich, young rulers to come to grips with their spiritual poverty. It is hard for us to believe in our minds that all the, all the treasures that we have accumulated by ourselves is really worthless to purchase things that actually matter. Do you know how that happens? A selfaholic has got to hit rock bottom. 
You see, that happened to one rich young ruler. He was very impressed with his treasure. He would have told you, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Pharisee. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Regarding legalistic righteousness, I've observed a faultless life. He was quite impressed with his resume. And then one day on a road, Jesus showed up and he hit bottom. And it changed everything. Later, he would write these words in Philippians. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. By the way, in that text, that word rubbish is the Greek word skubalon. You know what that means? Poop. Everything that I have accomplished and achieved and acquired and accumulated in my life is a big pile of poop compared to knowing Jesus. Paul is saying, the day that I hit bottom, I stopped being a resume reader and started becoming a breast beater. In the kingdom of God, those that exalt themselves will be humbled. And it takes great faith to believe in this culture, when it operates on the exact opposite principle, it takes great faith to believe those things. Are you going to let the culture or the kingdom of God decide what your value actually is? I think it's significant that when Mary learned that she was going to bear in her womb the offspring of God, that she sings a song. And in that song, she had a line that becomes the principle by which the kingdom of God operates. Luke chapter 1, verse 53 says this, He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. The hungry and the thirsty and the destitute are welcome in the kingdom. The rich are asked to leave. You see, not only are you going to believe that the first are going to be last, but Jesus calls us to have faith to believe that the empty will be filled. Who received the blessing that day in that temple? That Pharisee or that man that was beating his breast? The blessed assurance is that God responds with mercy to beggars. That's, that's actually why I believe that the poor have a head start in the kingdom of God. When, when Jesus shocked his disciples with this controversial position, he says, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Why? I think because the poor have a lot more practice at begging. God is looking for the poor in spirit, not the rich. The prophet Isaiah says in verse 15 of chapter 57, For this is what the high and lofty one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Look at verse, uh, the latter part of verse 2 of chapter 66. Same prophet. This is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Jesus said the exact same thing. He just used a different metaphor. Matthew 18, verse 3. I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He's not calling you to be childish. He's calling you to be childlike. 
at least to this point in my 52 years being alive, I have yet to have a child come up to me and show me his resume. We have got to come to grips with our spiritual poverty. I said earlier that Jesus sees two kinds of people, those that humble themselves and those that exalt themselves. Well, let me kind of modify that statement. Actually, Jesus sees only one kind of person, a spiritual pauper. It's just that the poor in spirit see that as well. We are all spiritual paupers. The only difference is some of us see it and some of us don't. So today, since we are all struggling as self-aholics, I want to give you some strategy to deal with our addiction. First, we must compare ourselves to God instead of others. William Meade, the naturalist, used to tell this story about Teddy Roosevelt. In the evenings at Sagamore Hill, the two would be talking and they would go out onto the lawn and they would search the skies for a certain spot of light in the lower left-hand corner of the great square of Pegasus. And then Roosevelt would say these words, Now that's the spiral galaxy of Andromeda. It's larger than our Milky Way. It is one of 100 million galaxies. It consists of 100 billion suns, each of them larger than our own sun. And then Roosevelt would grin, put his hands on his hips and say, now that I think we're properly small enough, we can go off to bed. One of the things that feeds selfaholism is that our standard is too low. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you right now and look that person right in the eye. Look them right in the eye. And let me tell you what that person's flesh is thinking. They're looking you in the eye, and, and their flesh is saying, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than you. There's no way I'm as bad as you are. That's what our flesh does. Since the flesh wants to exalt self, the flesh has to have a standard that makes that easy to do so. So when we measure ourselves, I don't use Billy Graham as my standard. I don't use Mother Teresa as my standard. I use Madonna. I'm not as bad as her. You see, we will always be able to go to the temple and say, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like him. You will always be able to find someone that can help your selfaholic prayer life. But poverty of spirit is the result of comparing ourselves to God. When Isaiah had that vision on the throne in chapter 6, he sees God. Look what he says, verse 5. Woe to me! I cried. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, Lord Almighty. That's poverty of spirit. When Peter has this great catch of fish in Luke chapter 5, and he all of a sudden realizes just exactly who Jesus is. Look what it says. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. If we would compare ourselves to God instead of to our neighbors, our selfaholism would stay in greater check. So turn back to your neighbor. Look him back in the eye again. And I want you to say this out loud to your neighbor right there. Say, hi, my name is, I am a recovering selfaholic. Go ahead and say that. Okay, I, I don't want you to have a whole session. I just wanted you to say that sentence. You see, only by looking at God will we ever be able to truly see ourselves? Here's the second thing. We must trust that God wants to fill and rule. That's the promise. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is, not will be, 
Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God is eager to show mercy to beggars. The amazing thing about God is this. Declare bankruptcy and he will wipe away all your debts. What did it say in that passage that we read? With the the Pharisee and the tax collector who was beating his breast. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. That man, the one who was beating his breast, he went home justified. The poor in spirit will experience the gracious rule of God in their lives. But I want you to hear this. God does not rule by force. Not in this present age. Now, one day when Jesus comes back, he will rule whether you like it or not. But in this age, God does not rule by force. He rules by invitation. He waits for you to surrender to the sovereignty of his rule and abdicate sovereignty of self. And I'll tell you something. It's an act of abdication that you have to make every single day, which leads to a third thought. We just keep admitting we are still in recovery. Poor in spirit is not an event. It is a lifestyle. Someday at the great resurrection, we will receive new bodies. They will be glorified bodies. We will be delivered from these decaying, sin-stained bodies that have Adam's nature. And we will finally be delivered from what the Bible calls the the flesh, the sinful nature. But until that day, we're always going to struggle with self-aholism. So we can never get careless. Back in 1985, the most brilliant young matador in Spain was named Jose Cabrero. And at one bullfight, he put on a brilliant exposition The bull, weak, wounded, finally fell to its knees when Cabrero put a sword right through its chest. The crowd went crazy. Cabrero turns his back and starts bowing before the crowd to receive the applause. But the bull got up, lunged at him, and gored him through his back, and that horn went right through his heart, and he died instantly. He thought he had killed something that wasn't dead yet. The only way that you will remain poor in spirit is to intend to do so. You must be resolute to be destitute. Now, one way is to confess your sickness to other people. The other way, is to beat your breast and ask God for mercy. And I close with this question. Are you too proud to do that? In just a moment, we're going to sing a song. It's an old hymn. And as you sing this hymn, I want you to pay very careful attention to the words because they're important. But before we do that, we're going to pray together. So why don't you stand up? And here's what I, what I want you to do. I, I want you to pray the prayer of the tax collector. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You might even want to softly beat your chest while you pray. But if you're too proud to pray this prayer, if you are too uncuffed, uncomfortable to to pray beating your breast and maybe your struggle with self-aholism is worse than you actually think so what I want you to do is just bow your head right now with your hands on your chest and just pray Lord forgive me I'm a sinner go ahead Father, as we look upon your face, 
Show your mercy and your face because we are sick. And we pray that you will always help us humble ourselves so that we might receive the kingdom of God. Give us, Father, through your spirit, the resolve to maintain a spirit of destitution before you. Help us to be poor in spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray.